Dude, there's white blood in there. This is huge. Oh. Imagine we are in a small American town. There's not even a traffic light here. All inhabitants know each other, and it would seem that such a place cannot bring us any surprises. But things start to get weird around here. One of your neighbors claims to have intercepted an alien message. Another claims to have seen a strange object over the city. And it is all somehow connected to a highly classified underground base going down seven stories beneath the town. What is it? Fantasy of people craving fame? Or the terrible truth? Or maybe there really are battles between humans and non-humans under your feet, as the rumors claim. It is difficult to check this, because access to the base is prohibited for ordinary people. But with us, you will learn a lot of interesting things, not only about this base, but also about other intriguing corners of the Earth. Forbidden Places on Our Planet Don't forget to like this video and subscribe to our channel to show YouTube algorithms the topics you find interesting. This place is so secret that even its very existence was officially admitted by the US authorities only almost 60 years after its founding, not to mention what is happening inside it. Members of the public are kept out by warning signs, electronic surveillance, and armed guards. Welcome to Area 51. A lot of questions arise at once. Is this the area with so much hype about it? Is there a crashed flying saucer hidden there and alien bodies being examined? Yes, it is. But it's actually just a US Air Force base. So why do conspiracy theorists like it so much if it's just a regular military base? Well, we have to admit, it's not really regular. Otherwise, it wouldn't be so highly classified. But let's go through every detail step by step. The base is located on the shores of the Dry Groom Lake in the Nevada desert, 135 kilometers, 85 miles northwest of Las Vegas. No one really knows the exact area, but judging from satellite images, it's about 100 square kilometers, just a little less than 40 square miles. That's about the size of two Manhattans. Okay, wait, are there publicly available satellite images of such a highly classified facility? Yes, there are, and they're very clear. And it's particularly strange because flying over the base is strictly forbidden, even for military planes, let alone civilian ones. But you can even take a look at the base from above and we'll give you a short tour. The location of Area 51 alone speaks for itself. It is situated just around the corner from the legendary Nevada test site, where US nuclear weapons were tested from the 1950s through the 1990s. On satellite images, we see a rather typical picture for such a military base. Featureless hangars of unknown purpose, other buildings, an airstrip, SUVs parked in a row, several airplanes parked. The territory of the dry lake is crossed by a hard surfaced road, in the middle of which we see an obscure platform laid out, presumably with concrete slabs, and no flying saucers, of course. What is the real purpose of Area 51? And what's really going on there? And what does the number 51 stand for? So were there some other 50 areas before this one? Or are they still there? There are lots of questions, as secrecy only promotes them. However, it is more or less reliably known that this military base was built during the Cold War between the US and the USSR as a center for testing and development of the latest aircraft. In particular, U-2 and SR-71 Blackbird reconnaissance aircraft were developed and tested here. The base opened in 1955 but the CIA officially admitted its existence only in 2013. Four months after that, Barack Obama became the first US president to publicly mention Area 51. So what is going on there now? There is very little official information, 
but it is presumed that the U.S. military continues to use the base to develop military aircraft. It is believed that about 1,500 people work there. They get to work exclusively by air, special flights from Las Vegas. The secrecy surrounding Area 51 has fostered many urban legends and fueled popular conspiracy theories. The best-known legend claims that Area 51 contains an alien spaceship that crashed in Roswell, New Mexico in 1947, and even the bodies of alien pilots. But the U.S. government insists there were no aliens, and the crashed ship was a weather balloon. Nevertheless, plenty of people claim to have seen UFOs over or near Area 51, and others assume that they have been abducted by aliens and even experimented on before being returned to Earth. Given these rumors, it's not surprising that Area 51 has been featured in a number of science fiction television shows, such as the X-Files series. And in 1989, a man named Robert Lazar claimed to have worked on researching alien technology at the base. He said he was personally involved in a reverse engineering of alien technology. That is, he said, a group of specialists possessing alien technology tried to determine how it worked and what principles it was based on. Despite the immense long-term interest in Area 51 and a lot of bold assumptions, there is not a single evidence that something really extraordinary is going on there. Every convincing assumption from conspiracists is followed by a much more convincing rebuttal from skeptics. By the way, if the closed and secretive nature of a military facility is easy to explain, the closed nature of many religious sites is much less obvious. But that's only at first glance. And to clarify the issue, we are going to the major center of the Christian world, the Vatican. It is the smallest state in the world, located in the territory of Rome, the capital of Italy. Its area is just tiny when compared even to cities, let alone countries. It is only 0.49 square kilometers, 0.19 square miles. This is literally just a few city blocks. For comparison, Central Park in New York is seven times bigger. But it's a separate state in every respect. Before the introduction of the euro, the Vatican even had its own currency and there was originally a deep meaning in this separation. The entire state of the Vatican is in fact a complete residence of the Pope, the head of the Catholic Church. The official population is less than 1,000 people, and almost all of them are cardinals of the Catholic Church, Vatican diplomats and clerks. Vatican citizenship can only be acquired, neither the right of birth nor the right of land, nor the conditions of naturalization apply here. And of course, it is a place full of mysteries and secrets that have captivated people's imagination for centuries. One can discover many things here, or cannot, because some places in the Vatican are inaccessible to the general public. And among those places is the Vatican Apostolic Library. In addition to rare print editions, it contains one of the most important collections of historical manuscripts in the world. It is not accessible for any tourist. Only researchers and scholars who have obtained a prior permit are allowed to enter it. But in the library itself, there is a place which is even more restricted and shrouded in secrecy. This is the Vatican Apostolic Archives. It used to be called the Vatican Secret Archive, but in 2019, Pope Francis changed the name to the Vatican Apostolic Archives. Probably, the church wanted to avoid misinterpretations this way. The fact is that the Latin word secretus means not only secret, but also special, separate. But the Vatican Archive did not become publicly accessible because of the change of name. Actually, until the end of the 19th century, it was completely closed from all unauthorized persons. And it was only Pope Leo XIII who ordered to give access to it for certified researchers. Of course, not for all. To get access, you need to submit a set of documents and get permission, which is not easy. 
Access is given only to really honored researchers, and everything is decided on an individual basis. Only paper, pencils, and laptops are allowed to be used inside. No photography, ink, or ballpoint pens are permitted. Only five requested documents can be viewed at a time, and only 60 checked researchers per day are allowed inside. What is the Vatican Apostolic Archives inside? In a nutshell, it's a total of 85 kilometers, 53 miles of racks with documents covering 12 centuries. Just about everything is here. Personal letters of European kings, proceedings of the trial of Galileo, and much more, which is just breathtaking. For example, there is an invaluable document that recorded the Catholic Church's excommunication of Martin Luther, a German monk who would change the course of history and etch his name in its scrolls for centuries. The Reformation, a movement against feudalism in 16th century Europe that took the form of a religious struggle against the Catholic Church and papal authority began with these events. This is how the Protestant Church emerged. The secret archives contain another extremely valuable document, which was strictly classified for many centuries. It consists of the records of the trials of the Knights Templar. It is the size of a dining table and is known as the Chinon Parchment. Released in 2007, it virtually rehabilitated the Templars and their legacy. Although the apostolic archives are already accessible to at least researchers, not all documents can be viewed. Only those dating back to before the death of Pope Pius XI, which is February 1939, are available with no restrictions. So, despite the change of name from secret to apostolic, the Vatican Archive has not stopped being secret. So what kind of secrets are kept there? And why are they so important that not even researchers have access to them all even after half a century? No one but the initiated knows for sure. After all, secrets are secrets. Rumor has it that they contain important information about controversial historical events, so controversial that it might be dangerous to make them public. The most conspiratorial rumors say they contain evidence of extraterrestrial life. Hello to Area 51. Now, let's go to a special place chosen for meetings by a special club. A secret club, of course. The very fact of the club's existence is no secret, but it is extremely difficult for outsiders to get into the place where its members meet. Only a couple of desperate adventurers managed to do it. This place is called Bohemian Grove, a 1,100 hectare, 2,700 acre site located in California. It belongs to a private men's club called the Bohemian Club. Since 1899, in mid-July, many of the world's most prominent men have spent a two-week holiday here. The Bohemian Club consists exclusively of men. Only four women at the beginning of the 20th century were honored members of the club, but still with certain restrictions. So who are the members of this club, and what is so special about it? Why is it shrouded in so many layers of rumor, speculation, and prejudice? The club consists of bright artists and musicians, prominent business leaders, influential government officials, high-ranking media executives, and even former U.S. presidents. It seems one should be outstanding in something in order to become a member of the Bohemian Club. Well, yes, but that's not enough. We'll talk about membership in the club a little further on. But now, let's return to its main location, Bohemian Grove. So what is going on here during those two weeks in July when prominent personalities come here from all over the world? Basically, it's a big high society gathering. Members can even invite guests to the Grove. Of course, not just anyone. The Bohemian Grove guest lists are strictly coordinated and carefully guarded against leaks well-known members of the club prefer not to give any comments. The symbol of the grove since its founding of the club is a 9-meter, 30-foot owl made of concrete. It symbolizes knowledge and wisdom. 
The statue is mounted on a steel pedestal in front of the lake in the center of the grove. Since 1929, an annual cremation of care ceremony has taken place here. It is a theatrical performance in which some members of the club participate as actors. In the very first one, the spirit of care was burned. But the conspiracy theory says that this is not a performance, but a real sacrifice. Still, what is the mission of this club? And why do these people gather? Well, just like members of any other club, to chat with a close social circle. Of course, it can be easily assumed that it is in Bohemian Grove where the destiny of the world is shaped. And it would be naive to believe that participants discuss nothing more than the weather at these meetings. The motto of the Grove is weaving spiders come not here. This means that all problems and business deals should be left outside the club. Sounds kind of ironic, because some important political and business deals were made exactly here, at least according to leaks from club members themselves. The Grove is particularly famous for being the site of a meeting in 1942 where the Manhattan Project was planned, which later led to the atomic bomb creation. The members of the club do not even conceal this. On the contrary, they often tell this story to new members. By the way, to become a fully-fledged member of the Bohemian Club, it is not enough to be just an outstanding personality. Sometimes, one has to wait for a long time. The point is that the number of club members is limited. No more than 2,700 people. New members have to wait for years for a seat to become vacant. The waiting time has sometimes been as long as 15 years. Long-term members of the club have their privileges. After 40 years of full membership, a member receives old guard status. This gives a reserved seat at the daily talks in the Grove and other privileges. Former US President Herbert Hoover was admitted to the old guard in 1953. In honor of the event, Redwood branches from Bohemian Grove were delivered by plane to the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York, where the ceremony was held, and were used to decorate the banquet hall for the ceremony. In his welcoming speech, Hoover compared the honor of old guard status to his role as a veteran advisor to subsequent presidents. The Grove's territory is guarded by armed men. The airspace is patrolled by helicopters. The guards use high-tech equipment, including thermal and night vision cameras, motion detectors, and alarm systems with vibration sensors. The security level is especially enhanced when participants arrive. Nevertheless, in 2000, two men, Alex Jones and Mike Hansen, managed to capture the ritual near the lake on video. And in 2004, a man who worked at the Bohemian Club and called himself Kyle filmed the interior of the concrete owl statue in the center of the grove by the lake. These were not the only cases in history when outsiders got behind the scenes of the Bohemian Grove, but so far, they are the most recent. And now we move on to another critical and strictly guarded location in the US. It is a 440 square kilometer, 170 square mile American military base in Kentucky. It is named in honor of Henry Knox, chief of artillery during the American War of Independence in the 18th century and the first US Secretary of War. The base is adjacent to the US Gold Reserve Vault, which holds the big part of the official gold reserves of the United States. That's what we are looking for. The vault is managed by the U.S. Treasury Department and guarded by the United States Mint Police. Its security is ensured at the highest level, the uttermost highest. The facility even looks so monumental and formidable that it inspires hopelessness of penetration attempts by its very appearance. It's located among the rocks. The roofs and walls are bomb-proof and the perimeter protection levels are simply exceptional. Steel fences, surveillance in all possible spectra, multi-factor alarm system, patrol helicopters, and of course, armed to the teeth paramilitary security guards. There is even a catchphrase in the movie, 
When police officers find a large cache of illegal weapons, they exclaim, there are enough weapons here for the defense of Fort Knox. The expression, secure as Fort Knox, a symbol of safety and security, has also become commonly used. And there is truly a lot to protect. It is one of the largest depositories of the U.S. Gold Reserve. According to official data, Fort Knox contains 4,580 metric tons, 147 million troy ounces in gold bars. Only the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, which stores about 7,000 metric tons of gold, has more. The vault was built on the initiative of the Treasury Department in 1936. The first gold consignments were accompanied by combat vehicles of the first U.S. Army. In the past, other valuable items, such as the originals of the U.S. Constitution and the American Declaration of Independence, were also kept there. A few more words about Fort Knox's degree of protection. This is something that could be talked about for hours. The aforementioned bomb-proof walls are made of granite covered with a layer of concrete. The entrance is barred by a door weighing 18 metric tons. To open it, you need to know the code, which is shared among several people and is not known to anyone in full. There is a self-contained life support and power system in case of attack. There are sufficient supplies of food and water. At the lower part of the vault is an escape tunnel for the case that someone gets locked in there by accident. It can only be opened from inside the vault and only when the outside doors are closed. If all this is not enough for you, we can add that the area between the fences and the concrete walls is mined and there are rings of barbed wire. The facility is protected so thoroughly that during World War II, the Great Charter of Liberties and British Royal Regalia both of which are of great historical value, were kept there. No ordinary visitors are allowed into the grounds of the vault. There have been only three cases of inspections of the vault by non-employees of the Treasury Department. The first one was made in 1943 by U.S. President Franklin Roosevelt, the second in 1974 by members of the U.S. Congress and media representatives. It was a reaction to a conspiracy theory claiming that the U.S. elite had secretly removed all the gold. And for the third time, the vault opened its door in 2017, when Kentucky Senator Mitch McConnell, along with a small group of officials, including Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin, visited it for inspection. Would you like to peek into the most legendary place of American gold? Share your thoughts in the comments. And we are moving forward. What would you expect when you go for a walk with your dog? Definitely not something like discovering a unique cave. But that's what happened to 18-year-old Marcel Ravadant in September 1940. His dog, with the funny name Robot, was exploring a pit left by an uprooted tree. But it was not just an ordinary pit. It had an extension, a hole that led somewhere. Then, Ravidot returned to the place with help, three friends. They found out that the hole was deep, to say the least. After crossing a 15-meter, 50-feet deep mine, they entered a strange cave. They thought it was a secret passage to the nearby Lascaux Manor, a passage that local legends told about. But the reality proved to be much more striking. The teens discovered that the walls of the cave were covered in animal images. That's how they became the discoverers of a world sensation. Since then, the whole world has known this place as the Lascaux Cave, near the village of Montignac in southwestern France. Its walls and ceiling are covered with more than 600 pictures. They are the result of the combined efforts of many generations of prehistoric people. Now, the age of the drawings is estimated at about 17,000 years, but there are still heated debates about that. The significance of the find was appreciated in 1979, when the cave was included in the UNESCO World Heritage List. The cave was opened for visitors as early as 1948, 
It was divided into a number of zones with halls having figurative names. The Hall of the Bulls, the Passageway, the Shaft, the Nave, the Apse, and the Chamber of Felines. Unlike the older caves, where depictions of mammoths and woolly rhinoceroses have been found in the past, the paintings at Lascaux depict birds, buffaloes, deer, bison, and horses, all from the interstadial period, when there was warming. The paints, black and yellow, red and white, were made from charcoal, manganese, okra, and iron oxides that were apparently mined in and around the site. But after just seven years, by 1955, carbon dioxide, heat, and moisture from 1,200 visitors a day had visibly damaged the images. As the air conditions worsened, the walls became more and more affected by fungus and mold. Eventually, in 1963, the cave was closed to the public. The drawings were restored, and a system of daily surveillance was introduced. But the French government still wanted to share Lascaux's riches with the world, so they constructed a replica of the cave and called it Lascaux II. It was erected not far from the original cave. To reproduce the famous cave paintings, artist Monique Petrol worked with the same natural pigments for five years. As a result, Lascaux II was opened to the public in 1983. However, it didn't end with that. There's also Lascaux III, a series of five exact reproductions from the halls of Neff and Val that have traveled around the world since 2012. And that's still not all. Lascaux IV is a new copy of all the painted areas of the cave. It is larger and more accurate with integrated digital technology. Since December 2016, it has been on display in the new museum on the hill overlooking Montagnac. And now we move to the southernmost point of Iceland. It is an uninhabited volcanic island in the Vesta Nayar archipelago formed by a volcanic eruption that began 130 meters, 430 feet below sea level and reached the surface on November 14, 1963. The ash columns then rose into the sky to a great height, and on clear days, they would have been seen even from the capital Reykjavik. The eruption continued until 1967, when the island reached its maximum size of 2.7 square kilometers, one square mile. Since then, it has steadily decreased in size due to erosion until it became 1.3 square kilometers, 0.5 square miles. According to the latest data, its maximum elevation is 155 meters, 509 feet above sea level, and it is expected that Surtsey will remain above the sea surface until at least 2100. By the way, the island was named after Surtur, a fire giant from Scandinavian mythology who set the earth on fire during the Last Judgment. Not only is Surtsey one of the newest islands in the world, but it is also one of the most filmed and actively studied, as well as one of the most restricted. Long before the eruption stopped, it was declared a nature reserve, and any trips there were only allowed to scientists. Now, very few people are allowed to visit Surtsey, and special permits are only granted for scientific research. It is forbidden to go ashore or dive near the island, to bring animals and generally any foreign living organisms, minerals, and soils into the island or to leave garbage on it. Construction in the vicinity of the island is also strictly regulated. Scientists have used this unique opportunity to study the gradual development of life on a clean piece of land. The development of Surtsey has been monitored since the eruption began. What do these studies give us? an idea of how the new island develops naturally and how its flora and fauna evolve without human intervention. In other words, it is actually a real natural laboratory. And what have the scientists seen over the years of observations? Various forms of life gradually colonized the originally barren land, 
scientists observed the appearance of seeds carried by ocean currents, the emergence of mold, bacteria, and fungi. By the end of the first decade, there were 10 species of plants. By 2004, there were 75 moss species, 71 lichen species, and 24 fungi species. Moreover, Surtsey lies on the migratory path of many bird species, and this played an important role. Petrels and loons were the first to be spotted here, followed by gulls, swans, wild geese, and crows. A total of 89 bird species have been recorded on Surtsey, 57 of which nest elsewhere in Iceland. The 141 hectare, 384 acre island is also home to worms, spiders, beetles, mites, flies, and 335 species of invertebrates. Thanks to permanent protection, Surtsey will continue to provide invaluable biological colonization data in the long-term future. And we're moving on to another island where we'll find a special place. It was created by humans and is intended to play a key role in our planet's biosphere if something goes very wrong. This is the Svalbard Global Seed Vault. Yes, yes, you heard it right. On an island above the Arctic Circle, between Norway and the North Pole, lies something vital to the future of mankind. It's not coal, oil, or precious minerals, but seeds. To get to this vault, you will have to descend 130 meters, 430 feet, into the bowels of the ice mountain. That is the depth at which it is located. Of course, outsiders can't get in, but we will give you a tour. Imagine samples of all the agricultural plants that exist in the world gathered in one place. In a nutshell, this is the world's seed vault, a kind of Noah's Ark for crops. It contains millions of seeds from more than 930,000 species of food crops. It is essentially a huge safe box that holds the world's largest collection of agricultural biodiversity. Given the plant breeding, it is basically the material embodiment of 13,000 years of human agricultural history. Why was this particular corner of the world chosen for this purpose? It's hard to find a more remote place than the icy desert of Spitsbergen. It is the farthest north you can fly to on a commercial airline. Spitsbergen was chosen precisely because of its remoteness. It is as far away as possible from places where wars are going on or may break out, or where there is a threat of terrorism. Also, it has sub-zero temperatures. The Global Seed Vault, which opened in 2008, was dubbed the Doomsday Vault. So it seems that these seeds will, will be used in case of a global disaster on a planetary scale. But the vault was actually designed to protect against much smaller threats the seed banks around the world could face. These could be anything, wars, droughts, or other local natural disasters that could threaten some agrarian plant species with extinction. There are three halls in the vault, but only one is currently in use. The seeds are stored here in vacuum-packed silver bags and in glass tubes, all stacked in large boxes and carefully placed on floor-to-ceiling racks. The seeds lying in the deep freeze of the vault include wild and old varieties, many of which are no longer used in agriculture. And many of them don't even exist outside this seed collection but they can be used to develop new strains that solve some problems of the world or a particular region. For example, if it becomes necessary to inoculate some plants with resistance to high temperatures or certain diseases. In total, there are about 1,700 vaults called gene banks in the world. The Spitsbergen vault actually serves as an emergency and universal reserve for other vaults and it has already partially fulfilled its main mission. For example, in 2015, seeds were taken from the Global Seed Vault at the request of the International Center for Agricultural Research in the Dry Areas, 
which was located in Aleppo, Syria. It had lost part of its collection due to hostilities. The seeds, awakened from their icy sleep, were planted in Lebanon and Morocco. The resulting generation of new seeds was partially selected and returned to the vault. Now, let's move to a warmer, though reportedly dangerous place. This story is like an Indiana Jones movie script. A stone army defends a closed ancient tomb that is said to be filled with priceless treasures and with deadly traps. Emperor Qin Shi Huang, founder of the Qin Dynasty of China, who ruled from 247 to 210 BC, was the first emperor of a unified China. It was he who initiated the incorporation of diverse city walls into one great wall of China and laid out an extensive national road system. However, he is probably most famous for creating a real army of clay statues known as the Terracotta Army. It consists of about 8,000 life-sized statues of soldiers, as well as numerous horses and chariots. Presumably, it was built around the mausoleum to protect the emperor in the afterlife. Qin Shi Huang was traditionally portrayed as a tyrant who drank wine infused with mercury for the sake of eternal life. At the time, they didn't know this toxic metal would work just the opposite. Probably, this accounts for his rather short life, only 49 years. In the center of Qin Shi Huang's mausoleum is a huge tomb where he was buried in 210 BC. This is one of the most mysterious places on our planet because the tomb has not yet been excavated. We know about what is inside from the words of the prominent ancient historian Sima Qian, who lived about a hundred years after Qin Shi Huang, and these descriptions are impressive. According to him, the tomb is filled with rare artifacts and marvelous treasures. Also, craftsmen were ordered to make crossbows that would automatically shoot anyone who entered the tomb. There is mention of mercury, which is supposed to imitate the Yangtze and Yellow Rivers and should flow by itself. At the top, according to Sima Qian, were images of celestial constellations, and at the bottom, the surface of the Earth. Even the candles were designed not to go out for a very long time. However, there is evidence in other records that the tomb was supposedly looted and destroyed long ago. But perhaps the mentioned crossbows and rivers of mercury have helped to keep at least the inside of the mausoleum intact. Today, the tomb remains closed, as it is feared to damage the structure while opening it. But belief in the booby traps inside is so strong that Chinese archaeologists are nervous about what they might have to go through to get to the supposed treasure. You may consider the whole thing nothing more than a fairy tale. Yet, when scientists measured mercury levels in the area around the mausoleum, it was much higher than they had expected. And if there is a gem of truth in this story about rivers of mercury, what about crossbows ready to fire when someone walks by? If they were made of wood, they're probably already rotted and therefore not dangerous. But if they were made of certain metals, there's a chance they could still be deadly. And now we move on to another secret location and a much more modern one. There, presumably, we'll have to deal with not the ancient dead, but something even worse. Dulce is a small town in the southwestern United States in the state of New Mexico. It looks like an unremarkable little town. It doesn't even have traffic lights. But according to the most bizarre rumors, it's just a cap a superstructure hiding a giant underground facility where unimaginable experiments are conducted. Get ready, some or even a lot of things in this story might seem like incredible conspiracy theories to you, but we'll still take a glimpse into this place, at least to set the record straight. So, some believe there is a secret base, a seven-story facility under this town. It allegedly contains creatures that seem to have leaped from the pages of sci-fi books. Just check this list out. 
human-animal hybrids, human-alien hybrids, and of course, the most incredible alien technology. Moreover, it is said that there have even been armed clashes between aliens and humans. Yes, it sounds like complete nonsense, but let's find out where all this came from. After all, not every American town has such an impressive legend. The first statements about the existence of the base date back to the 1930s, but rumors about the invasion of aliens in this area began massive spreading in the 1970s. They were associated with the name of the former New Mexico State Police Officer Gabe Valdez. He discovered inexplicable cattle injuries in the area, and Philip Schneider, a former explosives expert who worked for the U.S. government believed that Dulce was the site of a violent war between humans and aliens. Schneider, who had a high access level by the way, claimed to have helped build a secret underground base there in 1979. In it, he said he witnessed a battle with underground aliens that left 60 people dead and this war allegedly has not ceased until today. In the same year, 1979, another key figure in the Dulce Base conspiracy theory, a businessman from Albuquerque, Paul Benowitz, appeared on stage. He claimed to intercept messages from spaceships and alien objects outside Albuquerque. By the 1980s, he believed he had discovered a secret underground base near Dulce filled with gray aliens and humans. By the way, Benowitz has a PhD in physics. And Tim Anderson, a former Dulce police officer, claimed to have seen a UFO in the town in the late 1990s. Allegedly, it illuminated the entire valley and simply disappeared into the rocks. Similar claims of paranormal phenomena have been made at different times by different people in Dulce. And if you look at all this seriously, the explanations are rather prosaic. For example, religious and political scientist Michael Barkham explains that the presence of secret missile bases during the Cold War may have been the trigger for conspiracy theories that eventually grew into such incredible legends about a huge underground alien base under the town. But we will take a break from conspiracy theories and head to another island. Nihau Island. It is also known as the Forbidden Island. Why? Keep watching and you'll find out. Nihau the smallest inhabited island in Hawaii has an area of 180 square kilometers, 70 square miles. It may seem like the perfect place for a vacation in the tropics with beautiful palm trees, rare animals, and probably few tourists. But in fact, it's quite the opposite. There really aren't any tourists, but this Pacific island is completely closed to outsiders. In 1864, Elizabeth Sinclair bought Nihau from the Kingdom of Hawaii for 10,000 US dollars, which now equals about 190,000 US dollars. Then the island passed to her descendants, the Robinson family, and since 1915, strangers have been banned from entering the island. Nihau is now closed to all but the Robinson family and their relatives, US Navy personnel, government officials, and invited guests. It is managed by brothers Bruce and Keith Robinson. Life on the island is unusual. A little more than 80 of its permanent residents, native Hawaiians, live without paved roads, telephone communication, water supply, and stores. They use horses and bicycles as transport. Solar panels instead of electricity mains, and barges deliver food from the nearby island of Kauai. Children from Nihau take a weekly canoe trip to Kauai to attend school. The locals here speak a Nihau dialect of Hawaiian. Some have radios and TVs, although due to poor signal, they often watch pre-recorded media files. Nihau regularly suffers from droughts which sometimes force residents to temporarily evacuate to Kauai until rains replenish water supplies. Residents also typically commute to Kauai for work and medical care or school, so many of them call both islands home. 
To avoid a long boat ride, the island owners use an Augusta A109 helicopter for emergencies and just to transport residents to and from Kauai. Despite its tiny size, the island has played a small but notable role in history. It was the site of the 1941 Nihau Incident. After attacking Pearl Harbor, a Japanese fighter was shot and crash-landed on the island. The Japanese wanted to use the island specifically for emergency landings, as they considered it uninhabited. In fact, it turned out to be different, because at the time, the island belonged to the Robinsons and was inhabited by Hawaiians and even a few Japanese. The fighter pilot survived the landing and was amazed to find this surprise. The local Hawaiians didn't speak Japanese and didn't even know about the attack on Pearl Harbor. And they even helped the Japanese pilot at first. And then followed a dramatic story worthy of being screened in Hollywood. Lies, threats, hostage taking, escape attempts, shootings, injuries, murders, and even suicides. In the end, the Japanese pilot was killed, and one of the islanders even received a medal for merit from the U.S. government. And in 1944, U.S. President Franklin Roosevelt even considered Nihau as a possible site for the U.N. headquarters. These days, the island remains closed. The Coast Guard patrols it to make sure no one tries to land. People are not allowed to come here without an invitation from someone on the island. The only other ways to get close to Nihau are helicopter tours over it or boat tours off the coast. Unique heritage, manifestations of human genius, priceless artifacts. All this can be observed in such forbidden places of our planet. They help us better understand the history of our world and our place in it. We might not find aliens there, but frankly, we didn't really want to.